There's an anger burning deep inside Matt Murdock. An open wound made by an ugly world that won't close. And soon, it will tear Daredevil and his world apart. Marvel Comics launched the Marvel Knights imprint in 1998, a small division run by Joe Quesada and Jimmy Palmiotti of Event Comics, dedicated to more mature stories less connected to the line's daunting continuity. Daredevil was one of the premier comics of the imprint, relaunching with Kevin Smith's 8-issue Guardian Devil storyline, and followed by a series of short arcs that represented what Marvel Knights was originally all about. New voices, standalone stories, and experimentation. Writer-artist David Mack came on for Parts of a Whole, followed by Brian Michael Bendis with Wake Up, and finally screenwriter Bob Gale with Playing to the Camera. But the shifting focus of Marvel Knights Daredevil soon came to an end with Bendis' return to the title with issue 26 in 2001, collaborating with Bulgarian illustrator Alex Malev to begin a 42-issue story designed to challenge some of the foundational elements of Daredevil. What followed was a run covering nearly five years that many have crowned one of the greatest Daredevil stories ever written. From identity-changing revelations to a quiet mental breakdown caused by years of loss, this is a crime epic filtered through costumed violence. The result is something dark, personal, and disturbing. Examining the first half of Brian Michael Bendis' run on Daredevil, stretching from issues 26 through 50, and how Bendis uses grounded crime fiction storytelling to push Matt Murdock into a series of increasingly desperate choices, will reveal how, in Bendis' hands, Daredevil is his own worst enemy. What makes Bendis' take on Daredevil sharply different from the majority of previous runs on the character is that he applies a more realistic sensibility to character choices, world building, and the consequences of our hero's actions. That may sound cliché when seen more than a decade and a half later, as this has largely become the de facto approach to Daredevil comics and is the overriding mentality of the Netflix series. But Bendis' style on the title still feels fresh and enthralling, because the author uses his more grounded approach to actively pull apart several elements that had upheld Daredevil's status quo for years. To be clear, this isn't a story that is trying to use realism in its narrative. How can a comic about a super-powered blind man leaping across buildings and fighting costumed bad guys actually claim to employ realism? But instead, Bendis' Daredevil is more focused on the sort of real-world drama found in urban crime fiction. Mob bosses, drug rings, court cases, police investigations. Characters behave less like they're in a superhero world where aliens could start pouring out of the sky at any moment, and more like the court summons they've just been given could destroy their life. Once a certain amount of real-world logic is applied by Bendis at the start of his run, Matt Murdock's world and his tenuous grasp on sanity quickly topple like dominoes. I spent 10 years as a crime fiction graphic novelist, so my tastes and inclinations were towards the rules of film noir, and applying them to the superhero genre was very exciting to me, said Bendis. Bendis and Malev's Daredevil is also willing to change focus at any moment, much like how his initial standalone story, Wake Up, primarily focused on Ben Urich. It's not surprising when an issue is focused on detectives uncovering a criminal conspiracy, or when a three-issue arc details Matt's defense of White Tiger in a murder trial, or when we see the step-by-step -step process of a drug deal. Because this is the type of crime story Bendis came from with previous comics like Jinx and Torso. The world of Daredevil has had these crime fiction elements for decades because of the nature of Matt Murdock being a lawyer and a street-level hero. Bendis simply pushed these to the forefront. Most importantly, Bendis' Daredevil lacks a major, overarching villain pulling the strings. Malev's scratchy visuals play a major role in setting the tone for the story. Characters are rendered with blunt angles and excessive lines, giving them a sketchy look that maintains more realistic body proportions. This Hell's Kitchen feels like it's constantly covered in a fine layer of dirt and trash. Fight scenes are composed of images of impacts without motion blur, emphasizing the bone breaks and bloodied faces. It's all covered in a sheen of rough pencil shading and dirty colors by Matt Hollingsworth that makes it seem as if someone spilled an entire carafe of coffee on the Bristol board before they started. Most of these issues are also printed with black borders, similar to other Marvel Knights comics at the time. The darkness of the page subconsciously adds to the heaviness of the book's tone. Malev's also up to the challenge of crafting interesting visuals that balance Bendis' dialogue-heavy scripts. Bendis speak has become a bit of a cliché these days, and it's definitely on display here. 
fast-paced long exchanges between characters, short sentences, dialogue repetition, tangents on pop culture and food, and characters trying to voice their darkest thoughts with a lot of difficulty. It's supplemented by Matt's internal narration, providing deeper insights into this guarded protagonist. See, I think her plan, Natasha's plan here, was that just the sight of you would jar me, snap me out of what she thinks is some funk I'm in, remind me why I'm Daredevil, or the woman has known me half my life and she doesn't know me at all. Be quiet. Natasha, hell, everyone thinks I might have cracked under all this, this crap in my life. Stop embarrassing yourself, but no one understands. I know why I'm Daredevil and I know how important it is. And if I want to keep it all, I just have to fight smarter than I have been. Maybe even smarter than I am. She's not your friend, and I know what Foggy said to her. Why won't you shut up? At times, this approach can make characters have a case of same voice, but the snappy dialogue makes the conversations move. Letterer Richard Starkings breaks these conversations up into long paths of small balloons to prevent them from becoming an ugly wall of text, like the unfortunate approach found in Smith's Guardian Devil, and instead emphasizes the breaks between sentences and the fast exchange between speakers. This creates a more naturalistic flow to Bendis' talky, casual scripting. The characters of that level seem more interesting, more relatable, said Bendis. I can look around the world and see someone that reminds me of Luke Cage or reminds me of Matt Murdock. Murdock's voice couldn't be more different from my own, but I know someone just like him, and I was really able to tap into it, you know what I mean? Just really analyze that character. Bendis gets right to undermining the status quo of Daredevil by opening up his initial arc, Underboss, with the Caesar-esque stabbing of the blinded and weakened Kingpin by new character Sammy Silk and his fellow mobsters. Silk is new in town and doesn't understand why the Kingpin, and the many underlings in his organization who now know Daredevil's true identity, wouldn't simply take out Matt Murdock. That's probably a question most comic book readers have asked themselves at some point. So Silk quickly sets out to kill Kingpin, take out Murdoch, and set himself up in a position of power. Bendis jumps back and forth in time, going from the assassination attempt on Kingpin to three months prior, slowly filling in the gaps to illustrate how the entire power dynamic of Daredevil's world was disregarded and then pulled apart because of one outsider who didn't adhere to superhero conventions. Moving Kingpin out of the narrative for a long stretch destabilizes New York, as well as the conventional structure of Daredevil stories. Wilson Fisk may come and go from Daredevil comics, but his presence is a near constant for most of the 80s and 90s. But the public reveal of Matt Murdock's identity as Daredevil is the single biggest moment of Bendis' entire run. It's the status quo shift that informs everything that comes after, and was the big reason for Bendis telling the story. Throughout the history of DD, every writer worth a damn has taken the book and tipped it over, said Bendis. One of those situations is the mess his secret identity has become since the Kingpin got his hands on it 20 years ago. Not only that half the world kinda knows he's Daredevil, but that the Kingpin and Daredevil are stuck in a battle neither could win. I thought it was time to really smack that situation in the face. In the issues before his reveal, Bendis lets us see just how tenuous Murdoch's secret identity really is. Most of Kingpin's organization knows it. They simply don't do anything with it because the Kingpin tells them not to. When Silk gives it up to the FBI and one of their agents leaks it to the Daily Globe newspaper in exchange for fast cash, it feels like the last remnants of superhero plot armor being stripped away from Daredevil. It almost feels inevitable. I know before I wake up. I know my life is over. The revelations from the initial underboss arc flow into the next, out, as Bendis employs much more serialized storytelling here to create a narrative whose consequences stack on top of each other. Murdoch's outing creates a media circus and while he briefly considers confirming the news, he instead denies the claim and files a lawsuit against the globe. It's, of course, a lie, and a lie that doesn't sit well with those who know the truth, like reporter Ben Urich and friend Luke Cage. This moment marks the first true step over a moral line taken by Matt during Bendis' time on the comic, and it's not the last. If Matt's proven to be Daredevil, he'll have his license to practice law stripped away and be thrown in jail for tampering in legal proceedings. There's the option that Matt could come clean, take a black and white stance on the morality of the situation, and face the consequences. Or there's the other option, and time after time, Matt makes choices to get what he thinks he deserves. 
a continued legal career, punishment for the paper that outed him, a brutal stop to the Owl's efforts to make himself the new kingpin, and, most recklessly, the start of a relationship with Mila Donovan, a blind woman Daredevil saves from being hit by a truck and who is quickly seen as a kindred spirit. What's Daredevil without a love interest? The difference with Mila is that she's a normal woman with her own life, and her visual impairment helps her connect with Murdoch. Their love of Hell's Kitchen quickly cements their bond. But Matt pulling her into his life is the definition of selfishness. Sure he warns her and sure she makes her own choices, but he could have easily cut off their new relationship. The sudden return of Bullseye, who nearly kills her just to spite Daredevil, is the final straw for Matt. His explosion of violence makes their confrontation an ugly street fight instead of a bolletic superhero encounter. It's nasty, it's dirty, and it ends with Daredevil carving Bullseye's symbol into his forehead with a rock. Bendis and Malev create a narrative where years and years of grief pile up on the shoulders of Matt Murdock. Bendis constantly reminds the reader through sudden flashbacks, and Malev intersperses single ghostly panels of the dead. Sometimes these flashbacks are part of the overarching narrative structure of an arc, slowly revealing the truth in stops and starts. And sometimes they flood the page until we feel the weight of past tragedies mercilessly pressing down on Matt. Consider the layout of the final few pages of issue 34. In the aftermath of Matt's identity being exposed, his brownstone is surrounded by the press, but he still sneaks out in his costume. Foggy chews out Matt, telling him that he's breaking apart after the murder of Karen. All the while, Malev illustrates the argument in a series of double-page spreads, with Daredevil's run across rainy rooftops creating the larger image as a series of panels showing Foggy and the past are scattered across the page. Foggy's dialogue circles around the central image, creating a constant intercutting of both past and present. The effect is designed to disorient and create a collage of grief literally encircling the hero. Close-ups paint an image of a violently angry daredevil, face covered in an obscured mix of rain and tears. In the second half of Bendis' run, we'll see just how much the death of Karen Page has broken Matt, but for now, we're left with the symptoms. Matt's antisocial behavior and destructive tendencies clearly illustrate that the character is in the midst of depression, and using some extremely unhealthy avoidance coping to distract himself from just how much he's lost. The symptom is that Matt is angry at the world because he's angry at himself, and the violence he inflicts is made ugly by Bendis and Malev. Even if no one will ever be able to definitively prove that Matt Murdock is Daredevil, something this huge in the public consciousness can't be undone. Daredevil is in a cage. And it's a cage that Matt Murdock only makes worse for himself at the end of this first half of Bendis' run with the hardcore arc, as Kingpin makes a sudden, violent return to New York, his sight renewed and set on reclaiming everything that was lost. Now, Murdock and Fisk are on a collision course. But instead of being a climactic fight for justice and catharsis, it's an ugly brawl meant to prevent the re-establishment of the status quo. After everything that Bendis has thrown at Murdoch, this fight inverts the power balance in Daredevil's life. To mark the occasion of Daredevil's 50th issue under Marvel Knights, and to underline just how important this collision will be for the rest of the series, the Daredevil-Kingpin fight is illustrated in turn by Malev and past Daredevil artists Gene Colan, Lee Weeks, Klaus Janssen, John Romita Sr., Joe Quesada, Michael Avon Oming, and David Mack. Each blow invokes the past and reasserts just how much previous trauma is weighing on Daredevil. It ends with the Kingpin bloodied and broken at the feet of an enraged Matt Murdock. After all the violations of his personal and superhero life, Daredevil makes a choice that redefines his world. This first half of Brian Michael Bendis and Alex Malev's Daredevil story shows us how Matt Murdock has slowly become his own worst enemy. Not by tearing himself apart, but by elevating himself to a position synonymous with the man he hates out of sheer, blood-boiling rage. No matter how much he tries to justify his actions, it's power he'll come to regret taking. If from this second forward you sell your drugs, rob, or whore anywhere near my city, if you can't control yourself, if you can't figure a way to be productive in this life, find somewhere else. Far from here. Far, far from here. I am here to say, if you people so badly need some sort of kingpin, someone to lord over you, well from now on, it's me. I am not protecting this city anymore. 
I am running it. And I say, the people of Hell's Kitchen are my people. This is my territory now. And I say, get out or change. Tonight. You think you know me? You think you know who I am? These are the new rules. This is how it will be from now on. Spread the word. And if you think I'm kidding, look at the carcass in front of you. Look at him.